We have a serious problem on our hands that's not getting talked about enough when it comes down to insulin resistance in the brain. We think about insulin resistance in the body all the time, but we don't think about how it affects the brain. But remember that the brain is a sugar hog. The brain runs on sugar. And insulin resistance is simply when the cells cannot use glucose because insulin is not sending its signal properly. So that means in the case of our body, the body doesn't get the sugar that it needs to fuel properly. In the case of the brain, it's the same thing. So when the brain is insulin resistant, the brain cannot get the fuel that it needs. This can obviously manifest in fatigue and being lethargic because your brain literally isn't getting the energy or the fuel that it needs. But there's some very clear signs and very specific things that we're gonna talk about. So in this video, we'll go through the different things you'll experience so you can identify if you have insulin resistance that's affecting your brain. And then as the video goes on, we'll talk about ways that you can improve this through lifestyle, through diet, through different types of exercise, and a couple little tips and tricks. After today's video, check out Seed. Now, if you're looking at your metabolic health, one of the things that people don't look at is their gut, okay? Our gut diversity, our microbiome, plays a tremendous role in glucose modulation and plays a tremendous role in how our brain functions as well. Like this is not just a talking head on YouTube saying this. There are countless bodies of microbiome research that are backing this up now. And Seed is at the forefront of a lot of microbiome research. So that link down below saves you 15% off Seed's daily symbiotic with a capsule inside of a capsule. If you know me well, then you know that I'm not a big supplement guy. Like seriously, name five supplements that I talk about on this channel. I talk about magnesium, I talk about protein powder, I talk about creatine, and I really don't condone a lot of supplements. But I think for certain people, probiotics might just be the leg up they need to help their microbiome. So that link's down below in the description. The first thing that you might notice is that your memory, your short-term memory is not as good. You start noticing that like, the ability to just remember simple things kind of goes away. And a lot of times we attribute that to age, but now we're starting to understand that, wait a minute, maybe it's not just age, that like, maybe the whole age thing is actually just metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance creeping up on us as we age. It's not just the mere act of aging. So specific regions of your brain, like the hippocampus that are involved in memory and involved in these things, they are high energy areas of the brain. Okay, that means that they demand a lot of glucose. Well, if you're insulin resistant and you can't get that glucose into that region of the brain, it's gonna be like you step on the gas pedal and the car just falls on its face, right? You just lose that performance. Well, you don't recognize this as metabolic dysfunction in your brain. You recognize this as, where did I put my car keys? Shoot, where's my wallet? Ah, I can't remember what I'm doing. These short-term bouts of memory loss. That's a very clear indicator that something might be going on. Of course, it could mean a million other things, but it's just one of many things we'll talk about. You see, insulin is your friend in your brain. Okay, it is involved in so many different things. There was a study that was published in Lancet that demonstrated that insulin doesn't just allow the fuel to get into the brain, it allows for proper neurotransmitter turnover so we can actually feel things, serotonin, dopamine, feeling good, feeling bad, whatever. It's involved in vascular function. Without insulin in the brain, the brain slowly dies. So short term, you're gonna feel things like this. Now you have to start keeping track of how often this is happening and is it getting worse? Now longer term, you notice more serious cognitive decline. There was a study published in Diabetologia that took a look at over 500 people for over eight years, okay? And they found that the higher their HbA1c, okay, their glycolated hemoglobin, basically over the last couple of months, how high their glucose has ultimately been, the higher that number, the more the cognitive impairment they had. Now the hard part is, it's hard for you to look in the mirror and be like, I am dumber today than I was a year ago. You know, you need specific tests to kind of help you figure that out. But the bottom line is if you start noticing like, I've got this short-term memory loss and I just feel like I'm getting dumber, it very well could be the case, especially if your diet's not good, right? So it leads me into the next one. You start losing the ability to have this global thinking. Okay, less critical thinking skill. Remember when you're, you're young, you have all these ideas and you can put ideas into action and, and as you get older, it feels like you just kind of lose the ability. A lot of times you blame it on, oh, I'm just busy with the kids or, oh, I just have so many other things going on. I have less time and ability to sit down and critically think. And I understand that. But if you start losing that global perspective, that can also be a sign of insulin resistance in the brain. 
There's a study published in Frontiers in Neuroscience that found that insulin resistance in the brain can lead to a decrease in what they call mind span. And that's like the ability for your brain to remain healthy and your mind to remain healthy over a lifetime. Just like health span is our body, right? Mind span is sort of our brain. Found that insulin resistance in the brain leads to poor communication between the neurons, but also less formation of new neurons. It's kind of funny because we think about our bodies and we think about as we get older, we lose muscle and we have to work really hard to maintain our muscle. And that's sort of a physiological thing. But the same kind of applies to our brain, but in reality, it shouldn't be. We're using our brain more. We have life experiences. We have things that we've seen and done and we're using our brain. We should only be getting better. So the fact that our brains are reversing and going backwards means that there's an interference there of something that shouldn't be happening. Our brains should continue to get better and we shouldn't really be faced with cognitive decline until we're well into our older age. So when the neurons have an inability to really communicate, the regions of the brain have a harder time communicating too. You have less plasticity and less global thinking. So you become possibly even more myopic. Have you become more closed-minded as you've gotten older, right? So you gotta think about these things because there's literally some evidence to back this whole thing up. Let's look at it a little bit more. The next thing that you might experience is gonna be things like periodic headaches. And if the headaches start coming on more and more frequently, like you're like, I never had headaches before. What's going on? Why am I all of a sudden getting headaches now? And then you start getting them more and they become more frequent. And then sometimes the headaches become so intense that your vision becomes blurred. Okay, and then you start feeling really foggy all the time. Like you don't just feel like your brain isn't working well, you feel foggy. You're like, I, I literally feel like there's fog in my brain. Well, this could very well be the result of inflammation that comes from insulin resistance. So insulin resistance and inflammation go hand in hand, but we forget that it happens in the brain just like it does in the body too. There was a study that was published in Brain Behavior and Immunity that took a look at inflammation in, once again, the hippocampal region of the brain. And they found that this could lead to something called synaptic stripping by what's called microglia, which is an immune function that happens in the brain specifically. Now, when this happens, it breaks down that plasticity, the ability for the brain to be plastic. Okay, plasticity is like carving a neural pathway. It's like carving a canyon so that your brain function can fire and run down that highway in the canyon. But if you have a bunch of brain fog and you don't have plasticity, it's like you're having to carve a new canyon every single time you have a thought. That's what brain fog feels like. It feels like rather than being able to think clear down a direct highway, you're having to pave that road as you do it. It's like a literal struggle to think. So this comes on a little bit later because inflammation from insulin resistance isn't something that just happens immediately. This happens after a period of time of being insulin resistant in the brain. So it's definitely something you wanna think about. Now, one of the things that you can factor in metabolically too, from an inflammatory standpoint, there's a couple things that you can do. And I'm gonna to get to very tactical things, but exercise, one of the better things you can do for inflammation. So even if you have insulin resistance, being able to exercise and get the body to soak up that glucose is going to A, reduce the glucose levels, B, restore a little bit of insulin sensitivity, and C, reduce the inflammation that was a byproduct of it. So that exercise is a huge piece. The other piece as far as like, communication with the gut and the brain is concerned is looking at taking care of the microbiome, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute too. So we gotta focus on diversity of foods, which we'll get to as this goes on and I'll give you some more solutions. Okay, now the next piece we need to talk about. Do you notice a change in your behavior, a change in your motivational drive? Okay, there was a study published in PNAS that took a look at the association between insulin resistance and dopamine. Okay, dopamine, a neurotransmitter that is like our feel good motivation neurotransmitter. They took mice and these mice, they knocked out the insulin receptor. So that means even when insulin was present, it wouldn't bind to its receptor site in the brain. Mice that did not have the insulin receptor suffered from serious anxiety and serious depression. They also suffered from mitochondrial dysfunction and increased levels of oxidative stress, just because insulin was not able to do its job in the brain. Now they also found that there were some other things that came into play. Now they also noticed that there was an increase in MAOA and MAOB activity, and this is what's involved with dopamine turnover. So let me explain. When insulin is present, insulin reduces the amount of MAOA and MAOB, thereby increasing the amount of dopamine turnover. So in other words, it clears out old dopamine so that new dopamine can come in. When new dopamine comes in and binds to the dopamine receptor, we get a feeling of motivation, of drive, of satisfaction, of reward. 
Now, if we have no insulin or insulin isn't binding to its receptor site because we are insulin resistant, we have more MAOA, which means we start losing the inhibitory effect. So we have less dopamine turnover and more just stagnant dopamine there, meaning we get less motivated, which can absolutely change our entire behavior. Were you a driven person? Were you someone that had a different attitude than before? Now you've just become complacent. That's just one example. Your entire behavior and mood can change. And this is something that can happen relatively short term with insulin resistance. Now, the other thing we have to remember too is that if the cells and the mitochondria in the brain are not functioning well, this poses a risk as well. Okay, this is an issue because then you have more oxidative stress because of cells not functioning well, which leads to more brain inflammation, which leads to more issues. You can see where I'm going with this. So now that we've covered what's happening and what you feel like, you may wanna take some steps to address it. And the first one is going to be exercise. Just like I mentioned, simple exercise. Resistance training doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. It's talked about all over social media. That's going to be number one. Number two, if for any reason you can't exercise and you're sitting at your desk or anything like that, you've probably seen Andrew Huberman talk about soleus push-ups or calf push-ups. The soleus muscle within our calves, okay, so it's two muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, the soleus, if you're sitting down and you do like a calf raise while you're sitting down, that shuttles a lot of glucose. It seems to be a glucose disposal system. So every time you eat carbs or eat a meal in general, it's not a bad idea to get in the habit of doing some calf raises, whether you're seated or standing. And if you're seated, just almost like the fidgeting, like leg vibration sort of calf raises that some people do, those really annoying anxious people, well, maybe become one of those because that seems to have a powerful effect. Number three is utilizing a sauna. Okay, there's now some recent evidence that suggests that sauna usage can improve insulin sensitivity through a couple of different mechanisms, especially post-workout. So after you work out, whether you work out hard or not, sit in a hot bath or a sauna, whatever, and it can be any time too. It doesn't have to be post-workout, but getting that improvement in insulin sensitivity, you might start noticing the manifestation of those changes in your brain before anything else. Number four is gonna be a simple one. That's avoiding the refined starches and the refined sugars, okay? Little bits here and there, whatever. But make sure that you know, whenever you have those coming in, you need to be using them as fuel, okay? Food is fuel, it's that simple. You have those carbohydrates come in, go burn them. If you're not gonna burn them, don't eat them. Okay, now replace those with number five, which is adding polyphenol-rich fruits, polyphenol-rich foods and vegetables in general not just because they're good for your heart and good for your brain, but because those polyphenols make a very, very big dent in our insulin sensitivity. That's why certain fruits and vegetables are more than just the fiber that's in them. Okay, the antioxidants, the polyphenols, that helps us out with insulin resistance. That helps glucose uptake. That helps inflammatory response. These things matter. That's why the Mediterranean diet has such a tremendous correlation with good metabolic health. Number six is adding fiber into the diet for two reasons. One, it's going to lessen the glycemic impact of different foods that you eat. But more importantly, having that diverse microbiome, like I mentioned before, very important because that is going to A, be involved in the gut-brain axis that helps the brain, helps the mood, helps that entire situation. B, it affects the inflammatory response within the body, potentially modulates inflammation. And C, it improves glucose uptake. The short-chain fatty acids that are formed as a result of fibers fermenting help you suck up glucose into the cell. And like I mentioned earlier, I popped that link down below for Seed, the probiotic, if you wanna try them out. So that discount is right there beneath this video in the first line of the description for that daily symbiotic, that good probiotic that might help you out with that gut diversity. Number seven is going to be protein, okay? Protein's always going to be king. And I know that sounds cliche, and it doesn't mean you have to be eating 300 grams of it per day, but it should be the staple of whatever your meal is, okay? Protein first, because that's going to be what modulates the glucose response. That's what's gonna help you build the muscle that soaks up the glucose better. And then lastly, utilize apple cider vinegar now and then. It's really underrated when it comes down to glycemic control. Okay, so if you're trying to lessen the impact of a carbohydrate rich meal, a couple tablespoons of apple cider vinegar in some water can make a huge impact, much more than what you might think. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.